Hey, Senda. Hey, Phil. Can I tell you, like, the cool things that were happening uh, in the game that I ran for you the other night that, like, you probably didn't know what was going on? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. Well, cue music. And welcome to another episode of Pandas Talking Games. I'm your host, Phil. And I am your other host, Senda. And for tonight, firstly, as we keep saying, how many months in are we? Seven months? Oh, Good goodness. heavens. A lot of months. Um, this has been the longest amount of time till almost November, 16 years since March, you know. Um <laughs> Perhaps we just say this is our new show format. It, it is like, our current sh show format. Sure. Good. Anyway, we have a topic tonight from uh, Kevin. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you were going to say something else before the show topic, well, which it, is we are neither scripted no. nor edited. And that no. is just the new show. It format. became moot because you just said it was the new show format. So I just was like, well, never mind. We don't need to Here henceforth, <laughs> I declare on this day, October 20th. October. Well, it depends on which time zone oh, okay. you're in. Okay, well, it is the twentieth. Both for you. It, it, yes. both of those things are actually true right now at the time of recording. <laughs> it is both the nineteenth and twentieth, depending on which side of the Zoom call you are on. Yep. Um, here, henceforth, we are neither scripted nor edited. We are just pandas. Fair enough. Okay. Well, anyway, we have a topic for tonight. <laughs> we do. We have a topic for for tonight from Kevin. Um, who said, how much do you share with the players about what goes on behind the screen? More than half my table is not tabletop is what? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Yikes. Hang on. Uh, let me just try that again. I'm going to write down a timestamp and we'll see if I remember to go in and take it out. If I don't, you people are lovely. Then we warned you. We warned, we you, warned you. Not editing it. <laughs> Um, cool. So the topic is, how much do you share with the players about what goes on behind the screen? Often after a set piece or mystery is completed, I spend time telling the players what was going on that they missed or misunderstood. You've spoken before about meta talk at the tables, but so far it has always been from the player's perspective. What about from the GM's perspective? Cool. I love it. So good topic, Kevin. And let's, uh, let's do a little bit of definition about the meta speak. Mm -hmm. Um, Right, so the meta speak, sometimes known as meta gaming, um, this is the talk. This is the talk about the game that you are playing. Right, um, it sometimes has a negative connotation. In that, um, like sometimes people will say, like, "Oh, you're meta gaming that," so you're using player knowledge to make character decisions. Yeah. Right, like. Like, oh, like, don't worry about which door you pick because Senda's always going to put the thing that we need to do on the other side of the door. Right? No. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying, like, that is an example. Yes. That's an example of metagaming yes, where absolutely. You're, yeah. you're using that knowledge, right, um, to affect outcomes in the game. But that's not exactly what we're talking about tonight, right? So meta speak is more like when you as players are addressing what is happening in the game as players. Yes. Right? So sometimes this is like recognizing a trope. Right. Yep. Right? Like, so if we're playing a Star Trek game and you're like, uh-oh, holodeck accident. The starboard power coupling. Yuck, 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 Right. Yuck. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, how so about the one that I saw today? What's Riker's favorite state? Oh, boy, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> Don't do it. I'm just going to stop right there. Y'all can go, guess. Go Google it, kids. <laughs> go Google it. Um, anyway, no, I mean, jokes aren't really a meta thing. But so if we are at the table and we're talking about like something comes up and we're like, oh, that's a holodeck. Like it's a holodeck episode tonight. Right. Like that is that's meta speak. And it's not really ruining the game. But we as players are kind of talking about the game. So. There's also a space for GMs to actually engage in meta speak. Um, often GMs don't because GMs are actually sitting on more knowledge 
um, and information and clarity of information than the players are. Right. right. So the players are kind of piecing together what they have. And often that meta speak is the player's activity of trying to uh, assemble information. Yes. Right. So now they're like, oh, it's a holodeck episode. That's their way of telling everybody like, OK, these are the things that we can kind of expect to be happening. Right. These are the tropes that are in play. Yes, it will be deadly. Of course, all right. the safeties will be locked off, but we should still try to turn them off or like we should right. still try all of those things because that's what you do exactly. in a holodeck episode. Right. So, um, so the GM can also participate in this kind of speak, but it's almost always better in, and I think Kevin phrased it this way in the question, it's almost always better to do it after the fact. Yeah. Uh, because again, if I'm doing it in game, I know a lot more when I'm GMing than the players do. And if I'm doing it in the middle of a game, then like I could be steering the course of the game through what I say in, in that meta speak. It's really interesting. I'm, I am going to jump in and say it probably depends on how your prep actually works for a game. Um, sometimes... I do do it in the middle of the game with players because it's how I figure out what happens next. <laughs> well, that's, uh, I mean, that's a definite valid use. Right. So, um, so tonight we're going to talk about a couple ways that GMs can, um, can use that meta speak. And uh, we'll even address one that um, is kind of more of a um, cautionary. Yeah. We, I guess, like, we, we like have, if you're doing it, you may need to address some other issues. Right. We have we have three three reasons, sort of general, broad reasons that it can be useful and times when you might engage in it. And then one sort of con that we would recommend just, you know, acknowledging if that if this is the particular way that it's coming up at your table, then, you know, maybe there's stuff to um, follow up on. There's, yep. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk about what that is. Mm hmm. But we're going right, to leave cool. you hanging for the moment. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you, like, that's part of entertainment, right? So we're going to leave... Ooh, it's a cliffhanger. <laughs> it's clickbait. You won't believe. You won't believe. Here are three ways to keep your game going and one way to murder it. <laughs> yeah, there we go. You Perfect. won't believe. <laughs> you won't believe what that way is. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Too bad there's no clicks in this podcast. All right. So... Uh, since you have the list in front of you, I do. Um, decide whether you would like to address the first issue or kick <laughs> it to me. I am the notes fairy this evening. Um, cool. Um, so I'm I'm going to kick this to you. So the the first thing that we were talking about, um, just in terms of reasons that you might engage as a GM in meta talk, uh, was to show logic and consistency of the world that you're playing in. Awesome. I definitely can address this. So again, when we talk, when we were just talking a few minutes ago, one of the things that we said that um, a GM has is a superior clarity of what's going on in the game. Right? Players are operating on far less information than the GM is, and they, in many cases, are required to um, stitch together and or synthesize conclusions from what pieces they have. So often uh, players can run into a thing where uh, what they've observed looks very arbitrary. Yeah. Right. Like it doesn't make sense. Like why would that NPC do that? Like why would that NPC side with Baron Von Badass? That doesn't make any sense. And the thing that kind of builds off that is that players in a game and even more so in a campaign, uh, need to believe that the world operates within the, I want to say, the confines of logic that dictate that world, right? So, like, if you're playing something like Paranoia, like, this is none of this, like, everything I'm saying doesn't matter. But if you're playing something like a like a serious drama, like... Um, urban shadows or even D and D you need to believe that the world operates with some sort of internal consistency or logic. Otherwise the world is just arbitrary and the GM is just doing whatever they want. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't feel good. 
no, from a player perspective. It's not great because you have to trust as a player that the actions that you're taking have logical and in some way predictable like reactions, right? Because you should yep. be able to be like, we know that this NPC is a good guy. So if we go talk to him, then yay. If he ends up betraying you, then like it should there be because be there'd be a reason. reason, right? Like there's, yes. there's something going on. Um, and, and that reason can't be that it, it, I say it can't be that reason shouldn't be that the GM just decided that screwing you over would be more fun. Right. That's that that doesn't have even, anything to do with world consistency. or Even logic. if the GM wants that to happen, there needs to be a reason. Yeah, correct. And so sometimes when a reason isn't obvious and I've seen this a lot when I finish up a session like players will be like players will will finish the game and I'll ask like you know did you know did everyone have a good time tonight how did everything go and people will be like I I, I don't I, like I don't get why that person betrayed us that makes no sense at all right and so as a as a GM sometimes not always because it depends on what I could be revealing but sometimes I might drop a hint or two in the meta after the game. To be like, no, I get that that doesn't make a lot of sense from your perspective, but trust me, I think if you looked deeper into, you know, if you look deeper into Baron Von Badass's, um, you know, goings on, you might find a reason or something, right? Like, right. I, I, I may just drop something vague like that just so the players are like, oh, okay, it just, I, like, I'm not seeing it. We just don't it's know it not yet. Right. And sometimes that's just a good excuse. Like that hint is like, hey, you know what you should do next game. Right. Hey, hey, they didn't pick up on why that happened. So maybe. <laughs> maybe you want to figure that maybe out. Maybe you should like, figure that out and play that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think it is. I think there is definitely a place for, for Metaspeak to reassure players that the world has an internal logic and consistency and to allay their fears that uh, it's not arbitrary. Um, I think that's really important. Um, I am more tight-lipped with that if the game is a mystery. Yeah. Because in a mystery, I expect you not to understand a lot of stuff till you get towards the end. But if we're not playing a mystery, we're just playing like a straight-up sci-fi game or something, and you're like, that doesn't make any sense to me, I am more inclined to kind of tell you some stuff. Right. But you're probably not going to then sit down and this ties into our... Please don't do it this way. So we'll come back to it. You're probably not going to say, well, you see, and break out your charts of like, this is what happened. <laughs> like, I would I would at the end of oh, a game. That's fine. But I wouldn't do it like, thing. I wouldn't do it if there was still explorable space. Right. But I might, I might drop a hint in the meta so that the players are like, you know what? I'm going to go find, I'm going to go confront Baron Von Badass and find out why find he betrayed out. us. Or yeah. I'm going to go figure out what's going on with him. Sure. That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So I, I think I'm just going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to take these out of order. I'm going to go wild. Yeah. Yeah. Take, you just take one and then um, you kick one to me when you're, okay, when you're done. Okay. Cool. Um, so the next one on our list is to show the consequences of character decisions on the game. Right. So if, which is sort of, this sort of ties in to the one that Phil was just talking about um, in the way that like, if they don't see the direct um, consequences of their decisions, um, you can still, you know, reveal some of that stuff, um, mm -hmm. especially outside of the game. I mean, this, it, this, the meta thing gets a little bit interesting to me because um, the line for me as a GM is a little bit blurry. And if I were going to really do this and I wanted to do it in a game and we hadn't finished playing yet, um, and it seemed like it was a question, I would probably drop in like just a narrative like vignette or something that was just like, we'll just get a cinematic view of this thing happening as a 30 second flyby or whatever, you know. Um, but um, this is, to me, something that comes up frequently as like the um, part of the maybe conclusion of the game, like as everything's wrapped up. And we're going, I, I always think of this in terms of one shots. So like Phil can jump in and talk about this more for campaigns. Um, but uh, because then what you're doing is, you know, we're, gi we're giving ourselves an opportunity to see where all the characters end up. But then we may also have an opportunity to just quick talk through like, and this is what those decisions meant. 
It's what they meant to the world around you. It's what they meant to maybe specific NPCs that you are engaged with. Like, this is kind of where we left all of that stuff because of those decisions that you made, um, which I think is a cool kind of way to, you know, wrap things up with a bow on it. And it's it's a little bit sneaky because sometimes that ends up being a little more in-game. Sometimes that's out of game. Like if you talk about turning point, doing that in a meta way is written into the game. Yes. Right? Absolutely. So it's interesting because it's meta from the perspective of you're no you're no longer talking in character. Um, but it's not meta from the perspective of being outside the game because it's still in the game. <coughs> Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, the other place I like, like the place I like to use it, and, and this is even for one shots, is that um, when I run a game, and I and I, I this is very much my own personal um, style, and it's a thing I got into a long time ago, um, and it's a formula I really like, which is um, if I know the game's driving to a certain, a certain point, and I will say that this is a thing I prep more. Yeah. Like if I'm prepping a game more, yeah. um, if, if I know the game is going to drive to a certain point uh, and there is a chance, they'll always, I shouldn't say always, but my pattern is there'll be something you can do earlier in the game that will make the end point harder or easier yeah depending on the depending on what you did early on right like if you search this room and you find this artifact when you get to the end you will find that like it's easier to defeat the bad guy yeah right something like that and 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 if i'm doing one that does require more planning than i generally (laughs) it, it does and if i'm doing one shots where i tend to plan a little bit more if i'm doing one shots then i absolutely always put this in yeah right and one of the reasons i like it is because i like to reward players right so i like to reward players for um thoroughness ingenuity yeah engaging. those kinds of things yeah um so if, if, if players think ahead then i want them to do that now at the same time i also do that um in a ad lib way if a player comes up with something really cool, oh, absolutely, yeah. In the game, I will, um, I will jot a note to myself <laughs> on an index card. Yes, telling myself like, oh, um, well, because they did this, make the you know, like make this future, like give them a bonus in the final encounter, or, or make you know the um, armor of the of the villain less, whatever. Yeah. So I will just jot myself a note for that. So then at the end of the session. I like to tell the players those things. Right, right. That you did this thing and it was really cool because it meant that I gave you X, Y, Z. Well, right. Like, well, I want them, like, I want to close the loop on it. Yeah. Like, look, you were, you were in, you know, you were ingenious about this thing. So I want you to know that it had this effect on the game. Now, sometimes if it's like a bonus or something, I will just say it like at the table. Yeah. But there are times where it'll be like, oh, well, because you went and threatened uh, the shopkeep, like that meant that the shopkeep didn't um, join up with the rest of the thieves guild to um, to ambush you. Yeah. Right. So I made that encounter a slightly easier. That's not a thing I would tell them during the game. No. But it's a thing I might tell them after the game, like, yeah, you guys did a good, like, that was a good thing. Like, you, you know, you definitely, like, threatened that guy and scared him off. And for that, I made your, you know, later encounter easier. Right. So, I, so I like doing that, right? I like them to know um, when they've had a cool effect on the game. Yeah. Like a cool mechanical thing that you actually changed because of their actions. Yeah. And I, and I, and I actually really like um, and this is very much a me thing, right? This is very much my own GMing style. I very much like player actions having downstream mechanical repercussions. Yeah. Like, I like that coupling. Yeah. Cool. So. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, cool. The last one on our list is um, to show how the mechanics are working. Well, I'll take this one since uh-huh. mechanics is not uh-huh. mechanics is not a thing that you like to talk about too much. I mean, um, I don't know. You played their ghosts on this. This Discord has ghosts in it with me over the weekend. I did. I did. I'm going to talk about it on Misdirected Mark. Oh, cool. Uh, tomorrow. 
But um, so another time where uh, meta speaking and I will do this both after the game and I will do it during the game early on when we're first learning a game is to talk about the rules of the game from behind the screen. Mm -hmm. And, And I think this is important because as you are learning a new game or if you already know the game and you are teaching the game to new to new players revealing the mechanics of what's going on behind the screen helps the players um, make sense of the mechanics of the game, which is important because this is how players begin to get system mastery. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if it's like uh, I'm playing with a whole bunch of new players and um I, I'm trying to think of an example where I would do this. Like I would probably, some of these things I would just do right up front at the table. I definitely would do this at the table. If, um, if we're going with like some three, five, three, five D and D here and a player like attacks the skeleton with a sword, right? Like narratively, I'm going to say like, you know, your cuts don't seem to be doing a lot to the, to the skeleton. But at a meta level, I also want to acknowledge to this player who's not played before, by the way, edged weapons, you know, do less damage. Yeah. On on skeletons. Stabbing weapons are especially bad it, on exactly. skeletons. Like, <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. Like so I would want to do those things. Now, I'm running New Minera for the like I think this is like my third or fourth session of it. So one of the things that I have been doing, which I'm going to stop doing soon with my players, is that I have been talking through the difficulties being very explicit. Like this is a this is a level three difficulty. Yep. Right. Because over time, I don't want them to know because it's easier to game the especially Numenera. It's easier to game the system if you know where the target number is and what number you're comfortable rolling for. Yeah, and you can just mess around with it, spend experience points. Exactly. So yeah. eventually I'm going to stop, as the book suggests, stop telling them and just give them rough ideas. Mm-hmm. But for now, while we're learning the game, yeah. uh, because I want them to understand what it is I'm doing. Right. So I'm very explicit. I'll be like, okay, this check is going to be a five because the average person cannot do this. Yeah. And I don't remember if that's the exact thing. If you're a cipher wonk, don't yell at me for getting the level wrong. I don't have the <laughs> chart in front of me. But, <laughs> but, um, but I'll say to them, like, I'll be like, I've, I'm selecting this to be a level five because the average person cannot complete this task. And then we'll have the rest of the discussion. They'll be like, okay, I have this object, this skill. I'm going to spend this effort. I'm going to bring it down to this number and then roll. Yeah. Soon I'm going to be like, no, that climb looks pretty, pretty hard. difficult. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then let them, and then let them guess roughly where those numbers are. But I think that there's a, there's very much a place for it in the early, in the learning phase of a game. I don't want to say the early part, whenever you are teaching someone or whenever you are learning the game, having those meta discussions about how the mechanics are working are great. And then over time, as people understand it, you can just not have it as much. Yeah. That's really interesting. I don't usually think about that because in one shots, I'm basically always teaching the game. Right. And there's, there is no second session, third session where you get to just ease off on that. Like you're always teaching the game. And so the one that I always, that I really think of in terms of this, that I have run quite a bunch, um, at conventions is, um, one last job, right? Because we're always talking through, probabilities because it's like okay but you know no one is the worst at this yet or no one is the best at this yet do you want to engage that mechanic and um and and get that reroll or get that thing or whatever and the other part of that game is also like hey i'm sounding here's narratively what's happening like more guards come rushing in and then mechanically so that you understand players i'm sounding the alarm which means that i am making my dice pool bigger to make this harder for you um, and that's like mechanically what I'm doing. I get to do this, you know, once per scene or whatever. Um, so that people kind of get what's going on. And I'm not just like over here, like, oh, well, now my dice pool is bigger than your dice pool. Ha 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 ha. Right. And yeah. Like, and I think that's totally like it's it's that kind of thing. Yeah. Right? Like, it's, especially like and it's always in those moments where basically you're trying to help 
players understand what their decisions are, like what their choices are. Because um, the thing about One Last Job is that you're constantly trying to balance moving forward through the scene through like mitigating the potential damage, right? Like, so you're like, you're always deciding between like, do I roll to um, move the plot forward or do I roll to make it easier for us to keep going? Because like it can get so hard that you can't keep going, right? Like so, you're it, there's a constant balance there, and so it's one of those like you know this is what I'm doing, this is how many dice I have. What what kind of move are you going to take? Are you moving forward? Are you reducing the dice? Um, you know, I'm now making my dice pool bigger. Whatever it is, right? Yep. Yeah. So that's definitely one where I do do that a bunch. All right. So now the cautionary tale. Yeah. Here's the cautionary tale. Um, to sum it up. And then we will expound upon it, I'm sure, right? The cautionary tale is that particularly in like a one shot, (laughs) if we get to the end of the game and I go, I don't understand what just happened or I don't understand why we were fighting Baron Von Badass or something major along those lines. The cautionary tale is meta is not actually the way to solve that problem. It is in the moment because now you're past the point where you could solve it in another way. But unfortunately, what that moment means is that I, as a GM, if I'm getting that question, I've kind of failed to convey to my players all of the things about the game world that I wanted them to pick up on. And since I am the GM and I am in possession of all of the knowledge of the game that the players do not have... It is my responsibility to get that information across to them. And I should be trying to do that during the game instead of after. So the cautionary tale is very much that if you're finding that people are constantly going, I didn't understand what happened tonight, um, then the thing that we would recommend looking into more is um, making your hints clearer, um maybe just drop more of this stuff in character. The the thing you have to remember from behind the screen that is a weird balance to strike, right, is that everything is clearer to you than it is to your players. Absolutely. So, like, there are times when you think you are leaving the clearest hint in the world and they are not going to get it. And it's not because they're dumb. It's because they're not living in your head and they're not seeing everything Correct. exactly the way that you're seeing it. And, like... With yep. all of the information, everything is super clear. But when you chunk it out, it's not. And so there is just a thing to be aware of, which is that if you find yourself consistently having to explain the plot after your players have played through the plot, then um, then I would suggest thinking about how to make things clearer as you're actually running them through the plot so that that isn't what's happening. Absolutely. I think that um, if you... so. This is this happens a ton with mysteries, mm-hmm. uh, because mysteries are all about um, a a complete um, imbalance of of information. Knowledge. Yeah. Yep. So the players are trying to scrape together information and then synthesize conclusions from it and then act upon it, whereas the GM is sitting back with uh, complete and perfect knowledge. Um, so. You know, it is. I think it's imperative that, like, you should always try. You should always try to convey this in game. If you're doing it in meta, um, that's helpful. But it's also a hint that you probably missed something in game. And I highly recommend that little mini recaps or little check-ins. Right. Yeah. To make during sure the that course they, of a mystery. Yeah, they picked up are on all the really that important. Going. Yeah, I mean the to just to add. To that, like, to be clear, I'm not talking about, like, if I'm like, oh, so that one thing, that was like a red herring, right? And you being like, yeah, oh my gosh, it wasn't that funny or whatever. Um, Like, okay, sure, fine. Um, But... Um, if, if I, if I didn't get the whole thing, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. If you're like, I don't get why Baron Von Badass was even in why the adventure was he here, right? Like, why that's were we a sign fighting him, right? Like, exactly. There's a that's, problem, <laughs> right? Cause remember what players can't stand is that the world seems arbitrary. Yeah. Yep. Right. So if a player doesn't understand why the villain is the villain, yeah, that's like, you like some details have gotten left out of the exposition. Yes. Um, 
And again, we and we could do this as a whole separate show. In a one shot, sometimes you just have to posit those. Like you have to just put them down on the table, like like the scrolling text in Star Wars, right? right. Like it's, we don't get a we don't get a character study on why Jabba's the bad guy, no. but it's just set for us, right? He is Jabba the bad, bad. guy, right? Yeah. Right. And then we just and then we we just live with that and we don't have to ask any questions. But if no if, if no one ever explained Jabba the Hutt or explained that Han Solo owned money to him, yeah. and you're just like, why does this guy keep sending bounty hunters after him? Right? Like <laughs> now the world seems arbitrary. Well, but then if you're like, random, oh, yeah. in the meta, Han Solo actually owes him a shitload of money for, you know, for a uh, smuggling run that he had to dump. Right. Then you're like, Oh, okay. like, or you're like, cool. Like, I mean, if I'm sitting down at a one shot table and I need to get that exposition in, then that's where I like to also come back to the idea of like that 30 second vignette, right? Like we yeah. can cinematically, we could cinematically describe that terrible scene in like 30 seconds to a minute, right? Just don't say the conversation. Just like, you know, we could zoom in on Han Solo stomping on Jabba's tail. Unfortunate. Yes. Um, and, 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 you know, just real quick be like, oh, you know, the camera zooms in on Han Solo and Jabba and it looks like they're having a major disagreement. And then Han Solo says, you know, I'll get you your money for sure. I promise this time. And Jabba says you better. And then they leave. Right. Okay, cool. 30 seconds. Now everybody knows what's going on. Exactly. Right. Right. Like that's a, and we could do a whole show on, on exposition, right? Like, um, but but those two techniques, right? Just like the scrolling text where I just simply say like, you know, Han Solo was captured, you know, by the gangster Jabba the Hutt. Yeah. We've now established all of like we've established all of our stuff, right? Yep, like done. Exactly. Okay, cool. I think that's good, right? What do you think? Yeah, I think we I think we got it all. I think we addressed it just fine. Yeah. In which case, we need to talk about another show on the Mr. to Mark Network, and then we can go to the closing. Boy, do we. Oh, no. <laughs> what are we going to talk about? Well, hey, on She's the Super Geek, you can join me and Andy every other Tuesday uh, to play all sorts of awesome games. Um, and this particular run, we are playing Thirsty Sword Lesbians with the author of the game, April, who is a phenomenal and uh, it's Magical Girls, so tune in. Uh, back the Kickstarter. I love this game so much. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you should probably check it out. <laughs> I concur. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, say, Senda, where do people find us on the internet? Well, you can find us on Twitter at Pandas Talk Games. You can find us in the Misdirected Mark forums, which is forums.misdirectedmark.com, or you can drop us an email, panda at misdirectedmark.com. And Phil, once they find us in one of those places, what can they do with that information? You should, as Kevin did, and as many others have done in uh, episodes past, you should leave us a topic. Um, ask us a question. Um, pick a thing for us to talk about. Don't have to worry too much about the details of it. We're pretty good at whipping up a show around whatever it is you're interested in hearing, but we are really interested in talking about the things that you find interesting. It is, um, it's cool and it's satisfying that in some way we hope we've helped somebody, uh, out on the internet. Um, hopefully we've helped a couple people as we talk about some of these topics. Um, but yeah, we really do like doing shows about the things that you find interesting. So please um, just throw topics at us, topics, questions, ideas, whatever. We'll, we'll figure it out. We're, we're, like we've done this we're long enough. We got a fun one from Alice. It's about the ditch lilies. <laughs> I don't know if we can spend a whole episode on it, but I'm excited to bring it up sometime. Uh, yeah, no, we'll bring that up uh, next episode. Yeah, nice. That was good. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, uh, I definitely want to talk about that. Alice, just hang on. Your ditch little yeah, question yeah. will be answered. Yes. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, if you like what we do here elsewhere on the Mr. Mark Network, uh, please consider uh, supporting our Patreon campaign. Go to patreon.com slash MMP. Um, patrons of the show uh, get a bunch of stuff. They get the bonus outtakes from the show, which are pretty damn funny. Uh, they get the after show from Mr. Mark, which I swear is just a grab bag. It's funny. It's us ranting about stuff. I there's there, you'll like it like it's just 
I can't tell you what it is. It's literally whatever stuck in our head from when we recorded just gets thrown up for 20 minutes after the show. So I mean, that's kind of what whatever. our bonus outtakes have turned into, too, since I'm not yeah, editing. Yeah, it has, because we're not editing, yeah, right? I'm so, not actually taking outtakes out the Which is also just the, the bonus outtakes from the show is just us throwing stuff yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, hint, it'll be about Sunday's room today. Yay! Okay, anyway... <laughs> Um, you also get actually uh, you also get access to the Slack Room for Life. Um, I to me this is the big draw, right? Like the Slack Room for Life is a fantastic community. Uh, we talk about all sorts of things: gaming, not gaming, cooking. There's a lot of cooking going on. There's been a lot of cooking. Um, there's a lot of good cooks in the Misdirected Mark community. Yeah, there like, is. Except there's pictures of some pretty delicious meals you know, going on on a regular have any basis. Flowers, so. <laughs> That's a Bob thing. All right. Anyway, um, the Slack Room for Life is really, I think, the big draw. And you can uh, you can join us on Fridays for our luncheon. So if you are also working from home during these uh, quarantines, um, you can just jump on to Zoom as part of the Slack Room community and come hang out and have lunch with us. Lunch if you're on the East Coast. Breakfast if you're on the West Coast. Second breakfast, Second breakfast if you're at Mountain. Second breakfast for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, the really the thing is your patronage means a lot to us. Um, it takes a bunch to run the network um, from equipment to hosting and all that stuff. And it's uh, it's your patronage that actually helps all that happen. So um, we are immensely grateful for the people um, who are able uh, in these times to uh, to patron the show. Now. If you're already patroning the show, thank you very much. And if you're not patroning the show and unable to, it's totally okay. There is another thing you can do for us. Super helpful. Uh, supports our If You Listen to Us, You Will Love Us um, campaign. Uh, and it involves leaving a review where? Well, uh, on uh, you made me start in a different place in my spiel, and it totally caught me off guard. Um, you can leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or the podcatcher of your choice. Every new review we get really does actually help new people find the show, which is pretty fantastic because algorithms and stuff. And really, more importantly... To me personally, like right now, it just feels really good when people are still happy, <laughs> like when they like a thing, because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world that is not so happy. I agree. Yeah. It's really nice. Um, yeah. So thank you very much to everybody who has already left a review. We we really, really do appreciate them. They we appreciate it greatly. Warm our hearts and bring smiles to our faces, even on the difficult days. Yep. Absolutely. So thank you. Okay, then. Well, what mechanic do you want to reveal to me about our game that we played on Saturday? You're supposed to say show me, though. <laughs> this show is a joint production of She's a Super Geek and Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. Show me what you got, eh? Hey, show me what you got, show me what you got, eh? Hey, show me what you got, show me what you got, eh? Hey, show me what you got, show me what you got, eh? Hey, show me what you got, eh? Hey. Clicky. Oh. That's so funny. My finger did not quite click the clicky. Like it, I'm, I usually pick up right on the E and I didn't, which means that we're probably perfectly aligned this time instead of oh, you have to shift you back a tiny bit. So like I'm not worried about it, but also it's weird to <sighs> see the E as my first oh. thing. Look at my room. No, that's what we're talking about at the end. Oh, we're not, sorry. <laughs> totally not talking about that now. <laughs> That's a whole discussion for the end of the show. Good. Good. Okay. Well, then there's one other thing that I need from you right now because of Twitter. Go on. You have been challenged. Particles? Yes. <laughs> Molecles? Molecles? Particles? <laughs> Tentacles? I mean, always tentacles, but like, what about bicycles? <laughs> sure. Bicycles. <laughs> I pray to bicycles every time I go out on my ride. <laughs> I can't remember the other ones. There were more. Particles is my favorite. Particles is very good. Okay. Well, I just wanted to make sure. That's that for you, Rob. We got that out there. <laughs> I committed to making sure that that happened. <laughs> 
I like commitment to a good bit. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Whew. All right. You want to do a show? Yeah, we should do a show. Are you ready? Sure. Are you ready? I mean, yes. <laughs> what? Do the intro. Oh, I do the intro. I was like, what do you want from me? <laughs> Do you want me to say the first one this time? We don't have a no. script. Like we just no. The whole thing. If, no, no. If no, because if we do that, the whole thing falls apart. Yeah, because then I have to come up with the, the line whole in the middle. Show will come apart. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's just get a. Let's get. Let's, let's just do a. Let's do a silent five count so you have some space. Well, I'll just write down where we actually. Uh oh, I lost my. Hang on. Okay. Look, when we actually start, I'll just write down a timestamp. How about that? Do, do. <laughs> what am I gonna do with that? <laughs> you're gonna hard cut right into that, is yeah, what you're gonna yeah, do. Yeah, 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 yeah.